<laughs> if you've been fortunate enough to come across Le Rally's Denu Day, it was probably in the context of, hey, check out this band that was so radical, they remember hijacked an airplane. And while yes, that did happen, it's actually not the most interesting thing about that. Le Rally's Denu Day were a Japanese psychedelic band that started in the 60s, but basically foreshadowed the next five decades of underground rock through their sound and style. And they did it in a way that, while rough around the edges, was infinitely cooler. The rallies are mysterious, to say the least. The frontman, Takashi Mizutani, has given very few interviews, and none in the last three decades. He lives in secrecy, only emerging for an occasional concert, but even that hasn't happened since 1997. And while their profiles list a huge discography of releases, they are pretty much all bootlegs. To my knowledge, there's only two or three official releases, and they're all live recordings or studio outtakes. So many rumors circulate about this band, that their very first concert descended into a riot, that they passed out Marxist propaganda at junior high schools, that Mizutani is currently mentally ill, near death, or living well in Paris. It's hard to decipher fact from legend. While undoubtedly these myths make up some of the appeal of the rallies, it's not unwarranted. This is one of the heaviest, noisiest, and sexiest, yes, sexiest bands. Play rallies, they nudes, they find it very hot. <laughs> in the psych rock genre, and they did it decades before indie or shoegaze were even a thing. So let's dive in and check out the story of Le Rallies Denude. After World War II, Japan was devastated. So much of the country was in ruins, and the U.S. military had complete control over its rebuilding. The occupation leader, General Douglas MacArthur, originally wanted Japan to be a simple agrarian society. But the Cold War quickly changed that. Fearing a communist takeover if the Japanese people became too poor and restless, the U.S. encouraged the country's transformation into an industrial consumer democracy. By the late 60s, Japan's recovery was nothing short of a miracle. They had become the third largest economy in the world, behind only the U.S. and Soviet Union. The new middle class was snatching up such luxuries as TVs, cars, and vacuum cleaners. But the proliferation of American culture was also leaving a sour impression on some. Takashi Mizutani was born in 1948 and entered college in Kyoto right as Japan was booming. Like many of those entering college, he was idealistic and maybe a little angsty. With distaste for the Americanization of Japan and the consumerism that was all around him, Mizutani fell into a group of friends that favored French culture instead. They wore all black, hanging out in cafes, smoking French cigarettes, and reading Jacques Derrida or Simone de Beauvoir. They also started exploring Japan's emerging psychedelic scene. There was the Mops from Tokyo with a classic Summer of Love sound. And the Jacks, a more irreverent and avant-garde folk rock band. Inspired to join in on the action himself, Mizutani started his own band alongside bassist Moriaki Wakabayashi and two other friends. However, in an interview with Japanese BuzzFeed, he was a little more blunt about it. Rally was slang for being and one day, when the three members were walking through the Kyoto streets and sleeping, one of them proclaimed, Hey, we're the three rallies. Right away in early 1968, they hit the studio, laying down some tracks with a more laid back, folk inspired sound. But Mizutani was disappointed with the results, blaming the limitations of the studio, and he would remain skeptical of studio recording for basically the rest of his career. The band's sound, however, would change quickly. According to biographer Julian Cope, 
Two records released that year in America would have a profound impact on them. Blue Cheer's Vince Abyss Eruptum and the Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat, both of which pushed guitar noise chaos to new territories. Mizutani, who's notoriously vague about his influences, claimed it came from the free jazz of Ornette Coleman or Miles Davis. But in any case, the result was a radically new rallies. The fuzz was amped up. The rhythm became droning, repetitive, and hypnotic. Mizutani's voice became a shriek over a chaotic mix. In Mizutani's own words, the moment we heard the feedback from my electric guitar, we decided on the direction we'd go. And while all of this was happening, the student movement began seriously heating up in Japan. In October 1967, a Tokyo student was run over and killed by riot police during a protest of the Vietnam War. For basically the whole next year, the University of Tokyo would be overrun with protests. Led by student activists with a wide range of ideologies, including some radical communists, they were united around protesting the ongoing American occupation of Japan and the war in Vietnam. It culminated in the takeover of the Yasuda Auditorium by students, which they held for several months. Finally, in January 1969, the authorities had had enough, and some 8,500 riot police were sent to clear the building. For two days, the groups battled. Protesters stood atop the 120-foot-high clock tower, throwing rocks and gasoline-filled water bottles as police struggled to enter the building below. Among those present was Moriaki, now ex-bassist of the rallies. <laughs> Amazingly, nobody died, but between the police and students, nearly 1,000 were wounded. Moriaki, who by this point had quit the band to become more involved in the protests, was jailed for months. Perhaps this too is what gave the rallies their more urgent and nihilistic sound. Against the backdrop of chaos in the streets, the clash of ideologies, the Cold War, and the ever-present threat of nuclear Armageddon, the rallies played in cafes and student centers, including a famous gig at Kyoto University when it was occupied by students. But they were not outwardly political. Despite the rumors, the band never openly represented any particular organization or ideology. Mizutani was rumored to wear a black helmet, meaning he was an anarchist, or at least somebody who didn't identify with any political sect. Unfortunately, it wouldn't matter, because after 1970, the band would forever be attached to the worst kind of extremism. Former bassist Moriaki was among the nine students who hijacked the Yodogo airplane, demanding it be flown to North Korea. He had joined the Japanese Red Army, an extremist communist group. Amazingly, the Japanese authorities were able to pull a fast one tricking the group into thinking they were landing in North Korea when it was actually the South. Although the hijackers quickly realized the ruse, it led to the hostages getting released. When the Red Army did eventually land in North Korea, they had basically only themselves in a stolen airplane to show for. Although it had been nearly two years since Moriaki played in the band, the rallies were immediately thrown under suspicion. Mizutani, now under the watchful eye of Japanese federal agents and the CIA, went into hiding. He grew paranoid. Shows became few and far between as other bands distanced themselves from the rallies. It wasn't only the CIA tale, but just as Charles Manson had symbolically ended the Summer of Love, I imagine the Red Army had somewhat spoiled the transgressive, psychedelic music scene the rallies had been a part of. 
For the rest of their career, the band would live in this purgatory. There'd be no PR agents, conversations with record labels, or TV appearances. For a while, Mizutani supposedly hid out in the mountains in the remote north of the country, only emerging every so often to play a show with the varied cast of bandmates. And with now endless time to experiment with effects pedals and feedback, each concert seemed to be more wild and unhinged than the last. Since the rallies tended to play the same handful of songs at each gig, you can hear how they evolved over the years. Breaking from the accepted limits of guitar rock, and becoming the punishing mix of choreographed noise that you either love or despise. But while certainly noisy, it wasn't always an assault. The rallies never exactly ditched their folk roots, and some songs still have that delicate, heartbreaking feel. Many people point out its similarity to My Bloody Valentine, some 10 or 15 years before they'd record their first record. Through the 80s and 90s, the rallies continued playing these occasional concerts around Japan. Mizutani even allowed a French filmmaker to follow him and cut a VHS documentary in 1992. A very lo-fi one, that is. But then, after 1997, Mizutani vanished for good. He hasn't performed or been seen publicly since. This leaves me with the burning question of... why? Not just why he's living in secrecy when it's been five decades since the hijacking, but why does someone who has such a profound ear for music never put his full vision to fruition with the studio album? Why did he not let the filmmakers set up multiple cameras and a few more mics to try and better capture the live sound? And why sit back now as scraps of your live recordings get hustled on the internet, lining the pockets of bootleggers instead of your own wallet? Even Moriaki, who still lives in North Korea, has kept a higher profile, opening up about the band with a pair of interviews in 2017. <laughs> the last interview I could find from Mizutani was in 1991, and it was conducted over fax. Within that interview, though, I was able to find something of an answer. When asked why so many rally songs include lyrics about the night, Mizutani answered, Shown in bright light, the world persists fake and mass-produced. To the rallies, the night isn't stillness and darkness. It's a black hole of creation, continually destroying and building. Destruction, creation, past, future, positive, negative, these opposing concepts all come together, united in feedback. If the Rallies were the kind of band that played county fairs besides Smash Mouth, we wouldn't be talking about them. Shown in the bright light, they too become fake, mass-produced, and forgettable. When given only scraps and grainy pieces, the rest is filled in by our imagination. And that is more immersive than even a 3D U2 concert. For what it's worth, fellow 60s musician Makoto Kubota revealed in a recent interview that he spoke with Mizutani this summer. Like the rest of us, they chatted about the chaos of 2020 and the strange state of America, but they also talked about Mizutani's possible plans for a final tour. How true or serious this is, is hard to judge. But to Mizutani, I wish the best, and will refrain from expecting anything in return. <laughs>